Well, thank you all for joining us tonight in person and on Zoom. I'm Megan Doherty, the director of the Museum of the White Mountains. As we gather today, we're all on indigenous land. Those of us at the Museum of the White Mountains are on Indakina, which is the ancestral and present homelands of the Abnaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki peoples. We're grateful for their stewardship of these lands and waterways. For those of you on Zoom, we'll put some links in the chat where you can learn more about the indi indigenous histories of your place at native-land.ca, as well as the Abnaki people of Northern New England through the Musée des Abnaki in Quebec. As part of my research for our summer exhibition, I've been learning about efforts to preserve the culturally important brown ash tree, which is under threat from the emerald ash borer. So as we continue our Mountain Voices series this year focused on conservation in the White Mountains, I wanna share a tiny bit about two projects that are looking for more folks to get involved in their work. The first is based at UMaine Orono. It's the Ash Protection Collaboration Across Webnacket, or APCA. They're working with tribal nations to build a seed bank for brown ash. The other is the Monitoring and Managing Ash Project out of the Ecological Research Institute in Kingston, New York. And they're studying lingering ash as emerald ash borer resistant trees offer great hope for conserving the species. Both projects have many ways for volunteers to get involved. For those of you on Zoom, we'll put links in the chat. And for those of you in person, I'd be happy to talk more about getting involved um, if you're interested. And mark your calendars. March 7th is a Thursday at noon. We'll have the kind of whole research team from APCA, both the PI for the project, John Daigle, and three of the graduate students um, working on the project will be here for a panel discussion. Um, and so, yeah, so that'll be March 7th in person and Zoom. Um, throughout our Mountain Voices series this academic year, we've been exploring topics related to conservation in the White Mountains. Tonight's talk will pick up on themes we explored in November with Dave Anderson from the Forest Society. And if you missed that talk, you can watch it on our YouTube channel, and Kayla's just put the link in the chat as well. And so... Without further ado, tonight we're joined by David Gavatsky, who I know will be familiar to many of you, as he's been a longtime contributor to our education and outreach efforts regarding the history of preservation and conservation in the White Mountains region, and for his long service on our advisory council. So thank you. Oh, and most importantly, he is known in my family because... Exactly two years ago, he introduced a new word to our lexicon, which is growl. Because I, had, I had to look it up. I didn't know what it was, but we were supposed to go to Dr. Jerry, but couldn't because there was... Do you make it a, can you make it a gerund? It was grappling. I don't know. Okay, there you go. So um, <laughs> thankfully today, there was no grapple. It was an easy drive down from Jefferson. And uh, I'm grateful for that new word and um, for all of your support in my two years here. So thank you. As an introduction, David Gabatsky is my name. Um, I worked for 33 years as a uh, uh, with the U.S. Forest Service, and so a lot of what I talk about tonight will be somewhat related to um, the federal uh, conservation system and national forest. And, and I guess the important thing is that I've had a chance to visit all 154 national forests, 20 national grasslands, and one tall grass prairie that uh, is part of the Forest Service. Uh, management, public land. And so I've, I've had a long interest in in forest conservation history, and it continues to this very day. And I've, I've done a lot of research. And and I guess in some ways I was fortunate. Uh, I, Walt Wintery here, I used to work with Walt. Walt was on a different district, and we'd go off on fires. And so I got to visit a lot of different national forests and national parks and fires. And so you get to learn about the history of them and what happened before to to make the things that are occurring today. So tonight I'll be talking a lot about um, the early days. We'll start off 160 years ago and move on up through um, to where we are today. So let's go ahead and get started. And, and, uh, and of course, the views that I'm going to express tonight, uh, again, they're my own, uh, not those of the Forest Service or the museum, although I don't think I'm going to be saying anything too out of, uh, out of touch here. Um, 
I'll be talking about protecting the headwater forest, and I'm going to be going uh, back and forth from a national perspective, a regional perspective, and a state of New Hampshire perspective. And so here are the objectives. So what factors led to a conservation movement here in the White Mountains and the people, the organizations and events that played a, a key role? And watershed protection is what we're gonna be talking about a lot because that was really the impetus behind uh, protecting these Eastern forests. And what were some of the achievements of the forest conservation movement here in the White Mountains? And then I have five different places that we're going to visit uh, around the White Mountains just to talk about that. So I'm going to go back 160 years. And I mean, I could go back further. We could go with uh, Henry David Thoreau and Walden and, and all of that. But really, 1864 was the seminal treatise on um, that started the, the modern conservation movement. It was... Uh, Vermonter, George Perkins Marsh wrote this book, Man and Nature, or Physical Geography as, as Modified by Human Action. And I, look, I looked on eBay, I just wanted to see if they had any used copies. It was $9,860, so <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't buy it. Uh, but it is an interesting book, and it was really uh, probably the most important book for the conservation movement for about 50 years, uh, maybe 60 years. So that was really the thing. Uh, Marsh was, um, if you ever get a chance to go to Woodstock, Vermont, they actually have a, a national park unit, uh, a Marsh Billings Rockefeller National Historic Site, and they have a wonderful museum there. You learn all about this guy. But he was a diplomat working in various Mediterranean countries, including Italy, and he saw what was going on with overgrazing, over-harvesting of forest, soil erosion, and depletion of the soil. And he wrote this book as a treatise that if we don't take care of our environment, it's uh, man will perish. So it was a really important thing. So moving on, uh, 1867, our governor at the time, Walter Harriman, and the legislature decided to sell off um, that blank spot in the middle there. I guess I could use the mouse, but uh, it's that white area there uh, just below Bretton Woods and Durand, which was uh, now today Randolph and Dartmouth, which is the town I live in, Jefferson uh, today. So uh, the governor decided that they would sell off the 172,000 acres in the heart of the mountains for 15 cents an acre. And it was designed, the money was going to go into the um, school libraries. Uh, but unfortunately, um, speculators, they bought the land and they started logging off the mountainsides. And there were no clear title things and it wasn't surveyed. And before you know it, the state ended up paying more than double that and uh, the cost of uh, litigation on these various properties. 1870 was the start of um, modern day logging, a, a very uh, intensive amount of logging. And that started with the um, the Brown Company and uh, different than the one in Berlin, New Hampshire, the Brown uh, Brothers ran a sawmill and the Johns River Railroad from 1870 to about uh, 1883, went through Whitefield, Jefferson, eventually the railroad went all the way into Randolph and, and finally into Gorham and became um, the Whitefield and Jefferson Railroad and, and the uh, Boston and Maine. So the hillsides started to get logged off in, at that time. Um, Happening elsewhere in the nation, 1871, this is uh, the Peshtigo fire. Um, this was an important one. It happened on October 8th. Over 1,200 people died. Uh, between 1.2 million and 1.5 million acres uh, burned up. And it was really a wake-up call for land use practices at the time. And some of you... Um, this is Lake uh, Michigan on the right. Uh, you may be familiar with Green Bay, Green Bay Packers and that. It's uh, Dora Peninsula. And then it moved on into the upper peninsula of um, Michigan. And so 1.2 million acres, 1,200 people. The same day that uh, Mrs. O'Leary's cow knocked over a lantern in Chicago and, you know, burned up several blocks. And there were a few hundred people that died, but you don't hear about 
that. You hear about the Chicago fire, not the Peshtigo fire. Peshtigo is the name of a town and also a river there. So that was a huge thing because our population in, uh, in that particular time, 1871, uh, was really quite low. 1872, Franklin Huff, he was really the father of forestry in America, and he brought attention to the need for the government to consider the preservation of forests because he was actually seeing what was going on with the over-harvesting of trees and the rampant speculation and, and um, cut and run type logging. And so that really was the start. Franklin Huff later became an agent for the government uh, and, and, um, and worked for about 20 years as a forestry agent. 1875 marked the founding of the American Forestry Association. Today it's called American Forest. Uh, the AFA, they played a major role in the establishment of national forest reserves and the passage of the Weeks Act in 1911 that I'll be talking about. But uh, they, were, they were a key player. Appalachian Mountain Club was founded the following year, 1876, in Boston. Uh, they also played a key role in the uh, conservation movement. Their main emphasis was more on recreation and scenic protection, um, whereas the American Forestry Association was also looking at merchantable forest products and making sure that there was enough. About that time, 1885 and also in 1892, New York was the most populous state in the nation at the time, not California as it is today. And they um, were determined to um, keep the Erie Canal going and the Hudson River. These are major sources of commerce, of transportation. And because of intensive logging that was going on, lots of soil erosion, there was siltation going on into the Erie Canal, which is now it's a famous bicycle path as you can go through there. Some of you may have biked that, uh, but they were quite concerned about that. So the governor basically protected 270,000 acres in the Adirondacks and uh, uh, I'm sorry, 2.7 million uh, acres and, uh, and another 300,000 acres in the Catskills. So that was the beginning of this forever wild forest movement. And it was also the start of many, many hotels that were being built and these lodges and great camps. And there was some competition going on between what was happening in the White Mountains here and what was going on in the Adirondacks. So um, that was a friendly competition thing. So 3 million acres were protected way back then. In 1887, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, very active in, in big game hunting, uh, and George Bird Grinnell, who was an ornithologist and zoologist, they established the Boone and Crockett Club, and Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett uh, from that, and their focus was on big game conservation. Both of them were, were of course, big game hunters, and uh, to join the club, there was only 100 members allowed, and you had to have killed all of the key game animals um, that were on their list. So it was an elite group. Aristotle, per se, for sure, um, the, the people had a lot of money, but they also had a lot of influence. And even today, the Boone and Crockett Club is very influential in passing conservation legislation to protect uh, wildlife, and in particular, <clears throat> big game and the habitat. So 1889, but this time most of the American bison or what some people call buffalo had been exterminated. I mean, it was mass killings for a number of reasons. Um, sometimes they would only take the, uh, the coat. Sometimes they would only take the tongue and serve it as a delicacy. Uh, but in the earlier days, it was actually as a way to control the indigenous population or American Indians uh, by destroying their food source. William Temple Hornaday uh, wrote this book as a call to protect the American bison, which today, by the way, is our national mammal. You probably knew all knew that. You didn't know that. OK. <laughs> all right. So it is our national mammal and it's an important thing. You know, just a side note here. Uh, um, James Webb was the secretary of the interior and the bison on the Department of the Interior logo. I don't know if you remember this little incident. It was facing to the left. He was quite upset about that, that it was a left leaning bison. So he wanted to face to the to the right. And uh, I had to chuckle because it was just 
it was like millions of dollars to change the logos because there was so much, you know, stationary and signs and things like that. So they, they gave up on that. But anyways, Hornaday became part of the Smithsonian uh, Institution, the National Zoo, and they started actually um, a major effort to restock the Great Plains with bison and working with Native Americans to reintroduce the bison uh, after they were almost wiped out. 1891, here's our first state park. It was a three acre donation uh, on top of Pacman Adnock, which is in the Peterborough area. Uh, you may have gone up there. There's a uh, auto road that goes to the top. Um, it, it's now considerably larger, over 500 acres. Now Miller State Park named for uh, uh, the General Miller and three acres. So that was the start of our New Hampshire State Park system. A little bit different than the three million acres in the uh, Adirondacks and the Catskills, but we're a smaller state. 1891, uh, the key date. This is when President Benjamin Harrison designated 13 million acres of public domain lands in the Western United States to be held as forest reserves. And that was partially because of the amount of hunting that was going on. Uh, the president at the time felt we need to protect these areas that are owned by the federal government. And so he designated them as forest reserves, which essentially meant you could not go in there and, and cut trees down. So it's the start of the national forest system. The uh, Western senators in large part were opposed to this because they were working with the exploitation industries, but water companies, particularly those involved in irrigation, were in favor of it. So it was a mixed thing. A lot of people were very supportive of this, and uh, it's one of the things Benjamin Harrison is known for. So here's a, get a chance to take a look at this. Um, in the, uh, let me see if I can use this mouse here. I'm used to using a Mac. Uh, Oh, it's on the screen. All right. Oh, I'm not even going to. There it is. Boy, you got a fast mouse here. This area here was Yellowstone, and that was designated by, Gen by uh, President Grant, Ulysses Grant, as our first national park, Yellowstone National Park. And what Harrison did in 1891 to 1893, he basically started to put in forest reserves around Yellowstone. And of course, you can see over in Oregon, there's the Cascade Range had a, a number of national forests, and of course, California, Arizona, New Mexico, and, and a lot in Colorado. 1895, uh, Joseph Walker from New Hampshire called for the protection of White Mountain Forest. He, he actually started in, in 1872, but his 1895 address was, was really one of the most important ones. And so here you, you're starting to build this movement and more and more people are coming out uh, in favor of a reservation in, in the White Mountain region. Um, Joseph Walker eventually went on when the Society of Protection in New Hampshire Forest was started. He became their first secretary. 1895, I'll talk more about this when we um, get to the case studies here, but this was the Snyder Brook Track in Randolph. And this was when the entire Northern Presidentials were being logged off um, by the, um, the Brown Company of Berlin, the Berlin Timberland Company. And one of the landowners, uh, Laban Watson, who was the proprietor of the Ravine House in, in Randolph, went, and a lot of the Appalachian Mountain Club members went to Randolph because it was considered to be one of the best places for hiking, still is, um, and told him that he was planning on logging it, but he'd be willing to sell off a chunk of it. So I'll, I'll give you the rest of the story a little bit later, but that's 1895, first conservation track in the White Mountains. Here, 1897, President Grover Cleveland designates 25 million acres of Western U.S. public land as um, forest reserves. And this, he did this within a couple of weeks of when his term ended. And so you can imagine Congress was not very happy about doing this. He'd never consulted with them, but um, he, he definitely added to the acreage, uh, including the Black Hills of South Dakota, where you see that name Grover Cleveland just to the left of that, that 
green area is the Black Hills, and then a large area in Idaho, and then uh, in the upper left corner of um, Washington, you see um, Mount Rainier uh, Forest and some other national forest and um, Olympic uh, Forest Reserve. So a lot of acreage. 1899 was the uh, event that really catalyzed a lot of people to think about watershed protection. This was when the Johnstown, Pennsylvania flood occurred. At least 2,209 people died at the failure of a dam. Uh, it was blamed on the denuded hillsides that um, it didn't have vegetation on, couldn't hold water back, but it was really some pretty heavy rainstorms that were coming through, overpowered the dam. They tried to fix it uh, and it collapsed and the warnings didn't go out to the town below and, and thousands of people died. So this created the perception that if you cut over your hillsides, um, you could end up having floods uh, and, and that. So it's part of this whole stream flow controversy that actually still exists to this very day. And uh, a, a gentleman from uh, North Woodstock, uh, New Hampshire, uh, the Reverend John E. Johnson on July 4th, 1900, came out with a broadside that really galvanized the forest conservation movement in New Hampshire and essentially Massachusetts too. The publication was called The Boa Constrictor of the White Mountains or The Worst Trust in the World. And this broadside was directed against the uh, New Hampshire Land Company, who basically were uh, buying out the, um, uh, the farms and other things and preventing um, uh, people that lived in the area from buying lumber and that because they wanted to buy out the land at the cheapest possible price. And essentially, they were uh, freezing them out. Uh, they even prevented uh, funding going into the uh, hospital that was in uh, Woodstock and so forth. So this, this broadside really set um, New Hampshire on edge, and it was carried in a publication called the New England Homestead on December 8th. And I have a copy of this, and I, I love the, the drawing here. And uh, the New England Homestead would be the equivalent of uh, one of our popular magazines, like maybe Time magazine that we have today that comes out on a weekly basis. And so a lot of people read this, and, and every issue, and I've gone through a lot of the issues, really covers what was going on in the White Mountain region and, and really enraging uh, people. So that led a lot of people to say, we need to get organized. And so in 1901, as David Anderson uh, uh, brought up, the founding of the Society for the Protection of New Hampshire Forest uh, occurred. And their first president was the uh, governor who was uh, just leaving office, Frank Rollins. He stayed around 15 years, ably led the organization. Um, and, and it's a major organization today that works on forest conservation. One of the first things he did, one of the best things he did was to um, hire Philip Wheelock Ayers as the first forester. Um, this was an important event. Um, it, I think Dave really covered a lot about Philip Ayers, but essentially he was about 40 years old and he had a PhD in, in history, um, you know, strong background, but he had worked in um, social welfare for many, many years and was really feeling burned out totally about working with down and out people. And he decided that he was going to do something different. So he cashed out his life insurance policy and went to forestry school at Cornell University in New York, uh, got his degree and um, made himself known. This is kind of like his Superman pose here. Uh, so he accepted the position uh, on the condition that he'd be allowed to advocate for a national forest reserve in the White Mountains. And interesting strategy that he had. And first of all, he, he, he had been to the White Mountains before, but he didn't really know a lot about it. And so he set about to learn as much as he could about the White Mountain region by getting to know the people, listening to them, listening to the businessmen, listening to the paper companies who had a, 
uh, major interest in having a sustainable supply of forest products coming in. Listening to the towns, talking about the, the damage to the roads and what they needed to do. And so he slowly started building support for a forest reserve by showing people and uh, instead of telling people. He created a, an emotional impact, and um, his focus was on telling the economic story. And of course, you know, we had this uh, in the tourism uh, sector, we had the Adirondacks, which were attracting large amounts of people and hotels and the White Mountains, the same thing. We had a lot of tourism that was counting on having beautiful forest and not uh, hillsides that were covered in sawdust. So he developed a slide program. He used a magic lantern slide projector, these, these uh, glass slides, and he would go around well over 100 talks in the first couple of years to get things going. Because at this time, other leaders in New Hampshire um, were working on a bill so that there could be a forest reserve. And it took 10 years, and we'll get to that when the Weeks Act was finally passed. Also in 1901, Theodore Roosevelt became president, and uh, due to the assassination of, of President McKinley, he was actually hiking up in the Adirondacks when he got word of the passing of uh, McKinley. Um, now, forest and wildlife conservation became a national priority with uh, Theodore Roosevelt. He was immensely popular. He had been in the Spanish-American War uh, in Cuba, on the San Juan Heights and was very, very popular. Pretty much everyone loved him. Quite a character, too. Um, at the time, there was widespread logging going on. This is uh, on the Wild River Railroad on the uh, eastern side of the state, a Shea geared locomotive that could climb slopes of five or six percent so they could get these logging um, engines further up on the mountainsides. This is on the East Branch and Lincoln Railroad. So they were um, hauling lots of logs out. In 1907, that was the peak of lumber production uh, in New Hampshire, 754 million board feet. Anybody know what a board foot is? one inch by 12 inches by 12 inches. And I'll have a quiz question. Here. How many how many board feet is in a typical house? Walt, do you know? <laughs> no, I won't put you on the spot. <laughs> well, uh, there is actually a formula for that. For a typical wooden house, it's 6.3 board feet per square foot. So if you have a thousand square foot house, you know, 6,300, most of us are probably in the 2000 range. Uh, some of us might be in the three or 4,000. So you can figure that. So it's a lot of houses that could be built out of this, but we're cutting them faster than they were growing. Where did this picture take for that last one? Uh, that was taken in the Pemigewasset Wilderness uh what what it is today um and that i believe is looking um i'm, I'm thinking I'm, I'm gonna have to look that one up i've got it written down the source of it i'm thinking that might be osseo and yes osseo and flume yes. okay and the next one would be liberty so but i believe that's where it's it's taken and this one, this is on the cedar branch, uh, looking out over Owl's Head. And this one, Mount Paugus. And I know some of you are really into maps, so this is not where contour lines were developed. Um, <laughs> these are these are go back roads, and uh, they go. Uh, essentially about every 100 feet apart. So the way the hillsides were logged in those days, they, they essentially cut everything. Even the small trees were cut because what they were doing is rolling the logs down to the next road. And so they didn't want to have these five or six inch diameter trees that were blocking the logs. So they, they essentially cut everything as they worked their way on up. So these, you know, they pretty much scalped it all the way to the... Uh, to the top of the mountains. And at the same time, there were a lot of log driving on rivers that were going on. The Connecticut River, the Androscoggin, um, 
and, and other rivers. And this is a view above Berlin. Uh, it's clogged with pulp. Pulp is, uh, by definition, that four-foot sticks. But believe it or not, I used to cut pulp as 52 inches because they wanted to have a little excess on the sides. Just a little side note there, in case you didn't know. <laughs> I, had a, I had a chainsaw. John's read chainsaw. This was a long time ago. There were chainsaws, though. And I had a, a fiberglass wand at the end of the handle, and so I could have a 52-inch length by you know, doing that. So it's kind of a neat way to, to do it. All right, back to the program here. There was a major concern of a timber famine that was occurring. This was a common theme in the, uh, actually starting in the 1890s, that we were going to be running out of wood. This is a, in Berlin, New Hampshire, going for the, um, to the pulp mill. And you can still see some of these log cribs uh, in the river today. So after cutting trees, you know, you're cutting all the branches down, particularly the spruce and the fir and the pine, you leave those branches and those green needles turn red, you get full exposure to sunlight, full exposure to wind, and so what happens next is you have fires, and large numbers of fires were occurring, threatening towns. Uh, Berlin was surrounded on three sides by fire in 1903. And 85,000 acres burned just in the White Mountain region in 1903, 10% of the area. Uh, a couple hundred thousand acres burned in the Adirondacks and uh, throughout New Hampshire. So fire was a big concern because there was no organized way to detect, to communicate that there is a fire and to fight a fire. So it was volunteers from the logging camps that would essentially go out with shovels and, and pails and buckets and, and do whatever they could, but there was no organized method at that time in 1903. Uh, this is a picture of the Owl's Head Fire. Actually, I should call it the Bond Cliff Fire because uh, the fire actually burned on Mount Bond. That's Owl's Head on the right here. This is from Camp 13, high up in the uh, Lincoln Brook drainage. So what you had in the 1900s, you had cut over, burned over hillsides. There's a fire scar in Mount Liberty on, on the left, and you see the summit of Carter Dome on the right. And that picture was taken probably around 1907 uh, on the summit of Carter Dome. And um, the charcoal has pretty well gone off the trees by that point. But that was a 10,000 acre fire in Wild River Valley that uh, was very, very destructive. There's four fires over 10,000 acres in size just in 1903 alone. So in 1905, the U.S. government had what was called the Chittenden Report to talk about the forest conditions because they'd been hearing so much about what was going on in northern New Hampshire. And so they commissioned a report. It came out. It's a very interesting report. Uh, the maps are even better. Um, very well done. And following that, there was another report about the suitability of the southern Appalachians and the White Mountains uh, watershed for uh, a forest, national forest consideration. So those two reports were uh, influential in, in helping legislators decide. In 1905, the forest reserves are transferred from the Department of the Interior, where they had been run by the GLO or the General Land Office. And there was quite a bit of corruption that was going on, uh, major problems in interior. It's not like that today. Uh, but it was transferred um, by Theodore Roosevelt, uh, who's one of his best friends was Gifford Pinchot. So Pinchot essentially talked him into transferring these forest reserves uh, over to the Department of Agriculture. So then it became the U.S. Forest Service. And, Pincho was in charge. Pincho was born in Connecticut, and he had a family home in um, Pennsylvania. He later became a Pennsylvania governor, but he was really the first American school-trained forester uh, and had gone to Yale, put a lot of money into um, setting up forestry schools in, across the country. And one of the most interesting things about him, and I really get a kick out of this, is the Midnight Forest in 1907. So Congress um, 
the Western senators in particular, where they were not happy with Theodore Roosevelt designating all of these lands as forest reserves. And so they were determined to stop it. So they passed the Agricultural Appropriations Bill. And what it said was that no new forest reserves would be created and that the forest reserves would become national forests because reserve implies that it's not going to have any type of use, whereas national forest implies use, wise use of natural resources. So they, they passed that on February 25th, and they needed to, um, you know, Roosevelt then sign it right away. What he decided to do in, with Gifford Pinchot and the small staff of Forest Service people they had, they got together, worked day and night, and they created 22 new forest reserves, enlarged 11 others for 16 million more acres of, uh, of land that had gone from the public domain into this national forest. So then on March 4th, Teddy Roosevelt signs the uh, uh, basically irrelevant act uh, infuriating the uh, special interest. But uh, before his, his, by the time his term ended in 1909, he has set aside 150 national forests, five national parks, including Grand Canyon um, and some of the other important ones, 18 national monuments, 51 national wildlife refuges. So, you know, really, really a big thing. But the midnight forest creation was certainly audacious. And what this did in 1907, it was going to make it difficult in Congress to pass anything um, for forest reserves. So here's a picture of 1908. You can see, um, it's, I mean, it's, we now have a, a vast network. And if you look up into Minnesota, see if I can use this cursor here. Right there, that's the Chippewa and the Superior and the Huron Manistee. And uh, of interest, there's the Washita in Arkansas. And I guess you can see just down in Florida in the bottom right, that was the Ocala and Choctawhatchee National Forest that were on public domain land. And so he basically put them in the forest reserves. One of the most interesting ones though, I gotta go show you this. This is Kansas and uh, this little where my cursor is, uh, just to the left of Theodore Roosevelt's head, was the Kansas National Forest. And that was an experiment, 30,000 acres, to determine if they could plant trees in the Great Plains. They tried for a number of years, all different kinds of trees. It never succeeded. The only one that succeeded was a type of yellow pine, but it only got to be two feet tall. So they decided that they could not have a national forest there. So... They did have a national grassland, the Cimarron National Grassland later, but that was really the heart of the Dust Bowl. Kansas, Oklahoma, and uh, Eastern Colorado. Uh, when I went out there to study the origins of the Dust Bowl, I, I visited these uh, national grasslands and to see them today, compared to what I saw in the pictures from the 1930s, just amazing the recovery by taking care of this land. Uh, here's a cartoon. You may not be able to see all of it, but it's Czar Pincho and his Cossack Rangers um, <laughs> being in charge of the enforcing the forest reserve. So you have these special interest groups and particularly the stockmen, those people that raised sheep and cattle were they were just besides themselves that they had to pay a fee to graze their cattle and sheep on on public land. And it wasn't very expensive, but it was just the idea of it. And then, um, it, the, you know, the timber companies that did not own the land, but they wanted to cut the trees, they were quite upset about this. So these are some of the cartoons that came out opposing Pincho and opposing the, uh, the forest rangers. It's interesting that um, because uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt was a rough rider, uh, you know, a real Western outdoorsman. He actually hired a number of uh, rough riders to be some of the first forest rangers. And these were tough hombres. So um, they, got, they got the laws passed. So moving on up, uh, closer to the Weeks Act, 
And th these attempts to have an Eastern forest reserve in the original 13 colonies had been going on since essentially 1901. And the legal advisor to Gifford Pinchot, his name was Philip Wells, uh, a lawyer, very, very smart individual. Um, he reviewed the proposed bills that were out there and he determined that these things, they were not constitutional. What was happening was the federal government would have to buy land from private landowners, from willing sellers, but there was no constitutional basis for that. And so what he did, he studied it in detail. He found that the language was navigable rivers because it was the interstate commerce clause of the constitution that was the important thing and so once he worked with the legislators and wrote the appropriate language for them they now had a bill that was essentially bulletproof so congressman weeks um, the weeks act it was named for is actually the um, appalachian white mountain um, um, bill um, came out in 1911. It was part of it was passed in 1910 by the House and then the Senate. Um, it passed it in, in 1911, March 1st, President Taft signed it. And so here you have this interest in the watersheds of navigable rivers and to appoint a commission for the acquisition of lands for the purpose of conserving the navigability of navigable rivers. So, though, I mean, pretty clunky language, but that's how they did it in those days. And um, uh, and the opposition, Speaker Joe Cannon from Ohio in particular, he realized there was no way they could defeat it uh, because of the interest in the Eastern United States. I mean, it was a broad coalition of support, not just in New England, but in the Southern Appalachians, where there was a similar movement. And once they unified, they got together. And an event, I should have put it in here, in 1910 that really finished off the deal was the big blow up. This was a three million acre forest fire in Idaho, Montana, Oregon, and Washington, where 45 people were killed. And so as part of the legislation of the Weeks Act, it's working with other states uh, to provide cooperative forest fire protection. And so this brought more of the Western forest in. And so we still have that today. So uh, the Weeks Act, John Weeks from Lancaster, New Hampshire, at the time was a representative from Massachusetts, but um, sponsored that, was basically the floor manager. And you can see the White Mountain up here that... Uh, uh, became a national forest in, in 1918. And essentially you see quite a few of the forest here in the uh, original 13 colonies and that scattered around. As a result of the Weeks Act, by the way, we have uh, 41 national forests in the Eastern United States, 20 million acres. And almost every forest across the country is using the Weeks Act authority to buy land to add to their National Forest. So a major conservation event, even to this day. So protecting the headwater forest, these four of the five New England rivers was a big goal in creating this White Mountain National Forest. And these rivers are, this is the Androscoggin River, and you can see a map of the watershed. Uh, that was a famous log driving river. It's a picture I took an arrow. And here's the Connecticut River near Northumberland, uh, over 400 miles long. So this was probably the most important navigable river uh, that they were trying to protect. East Branch of the Pemi near Lincoln, New Hampshire, which is essentially that third river, the Merrimack River. And the Saco River. I know if you go to North Conway at times, you can almost walk across the river on canoes, uh, but it's a it's a you know, very, very nice river. And it, it starts uh, up in Bretton Woods at, at Saco Lake. So again, the perception was that bare slopes mean floods. And, and that was you know, a widespread belief. And so if you have vegetation on them, keep the mountains green. Here's a Forest Service poster from that era. Uh, talking about that, but Congress still did not believe that. And so what they required uh, for the White Mountain National Forest was for the U.S. Geological Survey 
to go and to investigate the relationship of cut over, burned over forest land and on runoff. And uh, a little bit complicated, uh, but the U.S. Geological Survey went in, including one guy you may be familiar with, Benton Mackay, the father of the Appalachian Trail, worked for two years in, in the White Mountains on the stream gauging stations. And anybody know the mountains in the background there? Kerrigan and Bowspur. Kerrigan and Bowspur and off and then the Kerrigan Notch. And, uh, the Anderson is one of them. There you go. What's the other one on that? Noel. Anderson and Noel, N-O-W-E-L-L. -L. And you can see on the backside of Kerrigan, there's quite a bit of logging that's going on at that point. But this was taken um, near Zealand Notch, and you can see the amount of logging that was going on. So <clears throat> The U.S. Geological Survey uh, went in and they put in 10 stream gauging stations. And, and back over the last several years, I've gone out and I've revisited all of these stream gauging stations and just to see what's left to kind of get an idea of, of what's going on. And Burnt Brook, by the way, is no longer called Burnt Brook. It's the uh, North Fork of the East Branch of the Pemigewasset, which is part of the Merrimack. I like Burnt Brook better, but you can see why they called it Burnt Brook. And so here they're building um, this stream gauging station. They're bringing in concrete, they're bringing in uh, logs, and and uh, so they can actually measure the, the runoff that occurs, much like how at Hubbard Brook, there's been experiments for, for many, many years on uh, stream flow studies. And here's, I went back in 2015. It, it, it's now along the Ethan Pond Trail, part of the Appalachian Trail. And if you go on that suspension bridge, you can look upstream and you can actually see where the concrete edge of that is. So um, there's 10 stream gauging stations and 175 uh, locations where they measured snow with these special cans. And so they'd have to go out on snowshoes and, and figure that out. So there was a preliminary report that came out in 1912. Here's another one. This is Anderson Brook, what we now call desolation, uh, where the rail line was going through. They're putting in the stream gauging station. This report, you don't have to read it from there, but it's several pages long. The preliminary report indicated it confirmed the link between stream flow and forest cover. And when you have a forest cover, the snow melts uh, slower than when it is, and you know, fully exposed to the uh, uh, to the sun. So they never did a, a final report. They just the USGS just did this preliminary thing, and they went on and. So now we have a national forest here. So uh, the stream flow controversy continues to go on between foresters and hydrologists. And uh, it's a little hard to um, spend just a few minutes on it. Someday maybe we can do a whole hour of talk just, just on that controversy. So let's go back and let's take a look through the years at, at five different tracks that occurred. I talked about Snyder Brook um, track and, and Randolph. And let's Go ahead and take a look at the history there. So the Appalachian Mountain Club purchased 33 acres uh, in 1895 for $400. So it's only a 600 foot wide strip for about a half a mile on up the mountain. And everything else was cut in that area. So when you go there today, you can see the second growth that's coming in. But when you go into the stand, I'll show you some pictures here. It's a pretty impressive old growth forest. Uh, during the Depression, 1937, the Appalachian Mountain Club was divesting a lot of their properties. And so they, they basically gave it to the White Mountain National Forest uh, for the use of the public, the American public, um, because they felt that we would take better care of it. And 19, it really didn't have any unusual protection other than, you know, just a, a written description that we're not supposed to do any timber cutting in that area. Uh, so on the 50th anniversary of the Weeks Act, um, the regional forester at the time designated this as a scenic area, which gives it a, a certain amount of protection. And there's a booklet on the right that describes the Snyder Brook scenic area. You probably have copies of that here in the... I'm in making the, a list, so we're going to check it later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there, <laughs> There's a great collection here of resources here at the museum that um, you can take a look at. If you don't have one, I can get you a copy. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, so here's what it looks like today. This is the Fallsway Trail on the left, and just these huge, a um, little hard to see with the light on, but huge hemlocks, and uh, there's balsam fir trees there that are the biggest that I've ever seen. They go up 90 feet tall. Uh, they've measured some of the red spruce in that area, 375 years, which is pretty remarkable for, for red spruce. So just a, a beautiful area to go. Several waterfalls were protected by these early visionaries of the Appalachian Mountain Club. And on the right is um, a map just showing you there's a trail going up on one side and that and down the other side and the other side of the bank. So narrow strip, 600 feet wide, but still today, it gives you an opportunity to visit one of the finest old growth forests in New Hampshire. The trail was not all the way up through it? No, it, uh, they used to have a trail, but the a valleyway it basically parallels further up. Mm -hmm. So it, um, they enlarged it by three acres uh, up to make it up to Tama Falls. If you remember, Tama Falls uh, goes up to there now. So it's 36 acre, 36 acre tract. Here is uh, uh, an interesting tract that was acquired by the state of New Hampshire, the New Hampshire legislature actually went out and purchased this land because it was being threatened with logging um, in 1911. So the legislature approved it and they were gonna buy it, but there was a problem in the paperwork. And so they, they couldn't actually buy it until 1913, but, but they did. This is a view from Mount Willard. It's a classic view if you're into geology, that glacial U-shaped valley and one of the finest hiking trails. You used to be able to, uh, to drive a car up there too. Uh, but you can, on the right, you see the, um, the railroad that goes through. It's now the Scenic Railroad. And of course, Route 302, Theodore Roosevelt Highway that comes up through. So they purchased it in Tiny Hearts location as a forest reservation on, on June 18th. They finally got the money together. So it's almost 6,000 acres, uh, but it was approved first by the 1911 uh, leg legislature. May I ask a question? Yeah. Is that when the school kids came to school with 10 cents to buy a tree? Uh, that was the next one. That was Franconia Notch oh. when they were protecting it. That was 1925, 1927. Oh. Yeah, but yeah, you're right. Uh, that the next, pretty much the next notch over was uh, one of those really important ones. Why didn't they just give it to the forest service? The state wanted it. They felt, you know, uh, again, it was 1911 when it was approved. The Weeks Act had just been approved and the Forest Service was not allowed to buy any land until the U.S. Geological Survey came out with their report. And so the, I'll talk about the first tract, which was not until 1914. So the state felt, and they were under a lot of pressure from the public and from the Society for Protection of New Hampshire Forests, and other organizations to acquire this, and, and so they did. Um, and they had a willing seller, and it's um, uh, it, it was interesting to, to see this. And so the areas outside of the state park, you go into what's called the dry river, presidential dry river wilderness, uh, congressionally declared wilderness. That was clear cut uh, between 1890 and about 1910. And so even though it's wilderness, but the state park actually has trees that are really, really old, old growth forest. And so today in Crawford Notch, uh, you know, a lot of people love stopping and seeing the waterfall, silver and flume, cascades, hiking, uh, Frankenstein, uh, beautiful waterfalls in the notch here. This is a, a very old yellow birch tree that's on the, uh, in the forest. You know, a lot of this area wasn't cut because of the landowner, the landowner that owned in unique at the time, which is now called the Notchway. And so these trees were, were uh, kept. You go out there today and, and there's some of the biggest yellow birch and sugar maple that you'll ever see. The uh, Appalachian Trail uh, went through there, the Webster Cliff Trail, uh, popular route to get to Mizpah Hut. Um, and here's a view uh, on Webster Cliff. This is, this is actually off the trail, I had to go down 
I was interested in seeing all of the stands of jack pine in New Hampshire. And this is the largest stand. There's there's about 30 acres of jack pine that grow there. Here's a few trees that are coming out of the ledge. This is an interesting tree because it has um, a serotonous cone. Serotonous means that it's like they're sealed in wax and it takes about 160 degrees to open up these cones that drop it. So they're a phoenix tree that after you have a forest fire, uh, these cones will open up and spread seeds. You go out west to uh, uh, say Yellowstone, you have lodgepole pine, very similar to this. So pretty neat tree. Um, and so I kind of like it. Uh, it's a it's a scraggly little tree, but it's kind of like New Hampshire. So that's, that's Mount Willard in the background. You see the... Um, the state park on the bottom there, the Willie Slide Visitor Center. And uh, and Doug, you're probably familiar with this area. This was the Pike Track. Uh, this was the first acquisition for the White Mountain National Forest. And it was, um, again, January 2nd, 1914. And, and some of the paperwork that I've seen in various magazines of that time, they, they talk about a different uh, uh, forest being acquired first, that on the Northern Presidentials, but that was actually the second. It came two weeks later. So here's what you have. Um, e. Bertram Pike, uh, Edwin Bertram Pike was the seller, and it includes parts of Mount Musilaki, the, the, the South Peak, Black Mountain, Owl's Head, the Hogback, and Oliverian Pond. Um, the Glencliff Trails is part of that track. So Pike was um, a businessman, and he had a quarry here, and in, in, uh, basically for for sharpening stones. It later became Norton Pike Industries, which is still around. They continue to make uh, sharpening equipment. So here's a historic marker that's out there, beginning of the White Mountain National Forest in, in 1914. You wrote that historical record, right? You wrote it. Yes. And somebody stole it the next year. I, they, yeah, they replaced it, but uh, somebody didn't. Yeah, there are people that don't like the federal government. Can you imagine that? <laughs> and they do things like that. Uh, yeah, historical markers, they can get you into a lot of trouble. Because, you know, we saw that one in Concord. There was a, a woman uh, on, on that. So but this one was less controversial. I can tell you. It took a petition and you had to go through a lot of different things. And you had to do a lot of original research and provide the deeds and other things to make sure there was nothing wrong about that. So, okay, we're moving up to 1928. This is uh, two left to go. This is Mad River Notch. Anybody know what Mad River Notch is? Scott? Greeley Ponds, yeah, and Mount Osceola, the east peak of Osceola is on the right, and Mount Cancamagus, which is, does not have a trail on it, is on the left, and I'm looking from the Cancamagus Highway, and so this um, event, again, Upper Greeley Pond, this is about 20 feet deep, it's a gorgeous place, again, one of those old growth forests. And uh, that gravel over there, that was not brought there. That was actually brought there by streams, erosion. So that uh, new word for you here, grus, it's a uh, rotten granite. Uh, <laughs> and, and this is a good trout pond. It used to be a, a shelter here, but they took it out because of overuse. So uh, if you've never been to Greeley Pond, it's, it's a fabulous place. This is the lower Greeley Pond. It's maybe three, four feet deep. You see a lot of logs in here. It doesn't have any fish, but uh, it is a just a beautiful setting. So what was happening was uh, International Paper Company had sold about 16,000 acres of their land for $1 million in 1926. That was a lot of money. And the Woodstock Lumber Company uh, bought the land and they had plans to put a logging railroad up through from the Cancom well, what we have today is the Cancamagas Highway, up through Greeley Ponds, and uh, there was a lot of opposition to this, and they wanted to harvest the 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 last really big remaining old growth forest, spruce forest around. And so uh, the New York Times, the you know the Boston newspapers, everyone was against it, and uh, they implored the U.S. government to buy this. But the problem was because it was such valuable timber, the U.S. government could not afford 
they would not uh, buy it because the price was too high. They have what's fair market value and they can only do a certain thing. So they they really resisted this. But Phil Bears, as I talked about in 1901, he led a campaign. There's a, a brochure there that I found in the files of the Forest Service here that helped save Waterville and uh, Mad River Notch. And he worked with the with the Forest Service, worked with citizens, and he worked with the Woodstock Lumber Company to, to develop a solution. And it was an interesting solution. So it was determined that the U.S. government would, because there was so much pressure, you know, never underestimate your ability to change the course of government, that there was so much support for this that the U.S. government agreed that they would buy 16,000 acres and allow the... Uh, Woodstock Lumber Company, later Parker Young, to continue harvesting like for 40 years. But in return, they would preserve this 810 acre tract in, uh, in Mad River Notch. So essentially Mad River Notch was protected in 1928. It became a uh, designated scenic area in 1964. And there's a postcard in the middle there from 1934, C.T. Bodwell postcard showing a trail going through it and a, and a lovely trail going up there. It's, you can also ski it in the winter, cross country ski it, uh, lovely place. And it's also a thing you can do, you know, the two peaks of Osseo and do a loop, um, which is a nice way to do it. My last one is, um, in 1932, it's the Hemingway, Hemingway State Forest in Tamworth. Anybody ever been there? Ah, I think so. Okay. Yeah. And, and Amy's been there too. So these are two very influential people, Augustus and Harriet Hemingway of Boston. They donated about 2,000 acres of, of uh, forest land to the state of New Hampshire in 1932 after Augustus passed away in 1931. Um, Augustus, born into wealth and ran a shipping business in Boston and just made oodles of money. But he spent oodles of money on philanthropy for Harvard University, for libraries and and various things like like that. He married Harriet Hemingway, who was a prominent socialite and legendary uh, for her work in wildlife and conservation advocacy. Harriet and her uh, cousin, Minnie Holly, founded the Massachusetts Audubon Society and later helped found the National Audubon Society. And they really deserve the credit for stopping the feather trade, which was in the millinery uh, industry. Uh, and this was 24 years before women were even allowed to vote. So she was a, a, a real powerhouse. And there were there were a number of other women that were you know really strong uh women that get a lot of things done, particularly in that Tamworth, Wano, Lancet area. So here's Hemingway State Forest and uh, the Big Pines Natural Area, which is about 170 acres in size. This white pine is 155 feet tall. It's not the tallest in New Hampshire, but um, it's one of the biggest. It's 12 feet around. And it's just a huge tree. And if you ever get a chance to do this hike, it's a, it's a very easy hike. Um, in Tamworth and go up and check out these trees. There's a group of us to go in for a hike. My friend, uh, Chris Kane on the right, who unfortunately passed away uh, a few months ago, he's measuring a huge hemlock tree with a uh, built more stick or merit hypsometer, which gives you essentially the diameter at, uh, at breast height. Uh, gorgeous place to go. And here's what the Full growth forest looks like in there. Uh, lovely hiking opportunities. The Tamworth Conservation Commission takes good care of it, working with the state of New Hampshire. So, a great place to go. So that's not a national forest. No, that's state. So, um, yeah. So Crawford Notch is a state park. I wanted to have an example of both, and and Hemingway State Forest is a state forest. So. They're both in the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources now. So, but that last one wasn't there a lot of incentive was the Forest Service was, was purchased to start buying up land, or was it pretty high? It didn't take a long time before the National Forest really for for Crawford Notch. Well, oh, for National Forest in general. Yeah, it's it, it's taken a long time now. The current acreage of the National Forest eight hundred and four thousand acres 
um, that we have. About 50,000 is in the state of Maine, Oxford County. But uh, so it's, I mean, it's a, it's a fairly large forest and it's fairly unusual in the Eastern forest that it's, it's continuous. Uh, no new lands were purchased in 2023. I checked on that. Uh, there were two tracks that were acquired. The Dundee tract in um, Chatham was acquired in 2022 and a, a really interesting one in Thornton. If you've never been to Peaked Hill Pond, uh, it's a lovely place to get on up there. Uh, so that was acquired from a willing seller. You, you see the Forest Service, like, you know, the size of the forest in like 10 year increments, or, you know. Yeah. And they won a big track down in, uh, you know, in Piermont and that, that Lake Trouton area that was just controversy about, well, that comes back 20 years, but they just came up with a man. There was controversy about whether the logging down there. Right. At the, the Lake Charlton tract is very interesting because uh, E. Bertram Pike needed the money from the sale of, um, of this, what we call a pike track. He wanted to sell those isolated tracks off so that he could buy the um, Lake Charlton tract. And so then it becomes um, part of it becomes. Um, National Forest Park becomes, you know, state state owned land. So well, that was required like 20 years ago, and I was yeah. involved with that with the creation of the state park. Right. And I was in the legislature. Yeah. But it was a pretty big size piece of land that they acquired, but they only got around to doing the management plan just in the last year or two, and there was quite a bit of controversy <laughs> about whether it should be logging on the Backside of Lake Charlton, I was approached about it. Right. And to me, and I was the Forest Service has always had logging, and so I yep. you know, I supported that. But you know, people you know, have different views about it. They're doing a lot less logging than they used to do. Uh, for sure. Um, yeah, that was a group out of Vermont that was opposed to standing trees. They they petitioned um the federal government so that they would not log in there, even though it had been logged many times before. I had a chance to I in my spare time, I, I looked at proposals under the National Environmental Policy Act to determine, you know, you know what's everyone complaining about? Um, and I didn't find anything, you know, I might have nitpicked a few of the prescriptions, but uh, in general, to me, it looked pretty good. There was some prescribed burning to uh, restore some blueberry barrens and, and that. Well, was there originally, they didn't have a buffer around the lake, which seemed in their original proposal, which was ridiculous. I mean, they should have had yeah. a you know, you know. Well, and without getting in too deep into the weeds, but in the National Forest Management Plan, they have standards and guidelines for these areas. And so that would automatically have a buffer. However, when you're preparing one of these documents and you don't put that buffer in, you know, that's a mistake. That's an oversight, even though they hopefully would not, you know, do that kind of logging. So it's complicated, you know, and, and writing these uh, proposed uh, vegetation management plans, um, they're complicated because they, they look thick, you know, 150 pages is not unusual when, Really, they're not doing that much compared to what was going on in the past. So, do you know about the logging going on at Pika Mountain Pond today? Uh, I don't. I don't. I, I know that there was a private. Casper Canadensis. What's that? Casper Canadensis is doing the logging. Oh, really? Oh, well, that's one of my favorite animals. <laughs> So yeah, that's always a problem. They might have to, the castor canadensis is the beaver, Canada beaver, and uh, interesting. I hope they're not touching my uh, rhododendron up there. Oh, yeah, there's some interesting plants up there. That that area is is just gorgeous up there. Other questions and and uh, controversial things. Oh, uh, that picture is Cherry Pond in my backyard, essentially about a mile and a half away. That's the presidential range: uh, Monroe, uh, Adams, Jefferson, Washington. You just barely see Monroe. So Madison, Adams, Jefferson, Washington, and Monroe. Are you Cherry Mountain? Cherry Mountain would be off to the right, and the um, just can't quite see it. And it's hardwood ridge in the middle ground. It's a fairly small um, 
Ridge. Walter here and I, we used to argue on where the boundary was between our two districts. And we'd have a peace treaty tree out there along one of the trails. That was a, that was a long time ago. So uh, we have one question in oh, yeah. the Zoom chat. Um, this is, what is the importance of river usage today for preservation as we don't use them for the same types of travel yep. in the past, particularly a logging and transportation method? Well, in the old days, of course, the rivers were the transportation method. But the important thing about river conservation was water power. Water power was, and it, to an extent, it still is in, in New Hampshire on the Connecticut River, and all of these other rivers have, have dams along them. So that's important so that they don't have the siltation clogging them up. And, uh, and dams have, you know, benefits and they have, uh, you know, detractions. So dams that aren't being used, uh, deadbeat dams are being removed. So you can allow fish and aquatic organism passage. So they're important for recreation. They're important for water. And, and I think if you had one thing to ask people on conservation, what's the most important thing? It's water and uh, drinking water. They want to have safe drinking water. And in, in forests, whether, you know, state forest, private forest, or uh, uh, national forest, you know, Preservation of drinking water is critical uh, on that. There's an interesting campaign that the Nature Conservancy does with uh, craft brewing companies. It's called October Forest. They celebrate, uh, of course, at these brewing places, uh, uh, clean water and the importance for beer production. So it's kind of a neat way to, to make that connection with having protection of the forest, protection of water quality. So that and then, October 5th, October Forest. Yes, October Forest. Yeah, that's where it came from. <laughs> Germany, you think that, uh, yeah, we're, we're beer making strong. Any others? Uh, that's it for other, other questions. Oh, we've, we've got a question in the back. Yes, Amy. please. I wanted to ask you how they actually made those stream flow measurements back in the early 1900s. Did they just go on the yardstick or something? And no, they actually had detailed engineering diagrams. And I can get you copies of, of those that had been tested out. Um, and at the 10 different stations that I, I visited, you know, you can, you can see where there was a weir uh, where the water would flow through and they would take measurements uh, at various times of the day and various times of the year for this two year period. Um, so but, but with some kind of an instrument, as far as the instruments, um, they were gauges that they used, and they were housed in a you know small building about the size of an outhouse, and uh, that had those gauges. Yeah, I mean that's that's that one. There's a concrete one. Yeah, these these were similar, and they would they would go into the stream, and they had they had a couple of control stations. One of the control stations is um, on the Crawford Path, uh, just up from the AMC Highland Center, at Crawford Notch. So you go up about a quarter mile past the um, Evans uh, uh, cutoff. And there's a there's a place on the left. You'll actually see a pipeline uh, and a, a concrete dam that went to the hotel. But just above that, the uh, geological survey had a uh, stream gauging station. That area had never been cut. The Gibbsburg drainage was protected by the hotel, so they uh, they didn't allow logging there. So that was a control unit, and uh, you can actually find wires in there. So these old rubber insulated wires. That's, you know, over a hundred years ago. So quite fascinating. Some of these, some of these places, Covered Brook, for instance, is way out. It's a it's a day's hike in just to get to it. So I camped overnight with my my friend and and checked it out. But I do have the I do have the plans and um, and that's that is available. I think they develop rain skirts for the shoulders. Uh, as, as far as visiting? No, no, readings for, for the... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. The, 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 studies, the studies were detailed, and and uh, Benton Mackay actually wrote the forestry portion of the report, and other people wrote the soils, the geology, and then the water portion. But it never really did solve the stream flow controversy of, of whether cut over, burned over forest would... Um, um, you know, prevent flood loss because in, in reality, there's a certain amount of saturation, even if you have, you know, total forest cover and vegetation, it'll get saturated with too much rain and you'll still get the flooding. So 
probably they should have been looking at the flood gauge station that we have here in uh, in Plymouth. You know, that would have been another one to look at. But it was a perception at the time that you cut the trees off uh, and, and burn the, the slopes. You're going to have a lot of erosion going in and you're going to have a lot of water running down in the spring. And then in the summer, it's going to dry up and hydropower is going to be affected by it. So widespread perception. Other, yeah. Yeah, well. Can you say more about the uh, definition of navigable stream? <laughs> I mean, how far up stream uh, in the order of streams is that applied to? A canoe. <laughs> okay. Yeah, a, a canoe. And, and it was left purposely vague. Um, and so it would be up to the courts to decide on the legislation. You know, we, we have that going on every day in, in America between legislation and, and courts and how they interpret it. So a clunky definition, uh, but it was decided that, uh, you know, the Connecticut River certainly and, and these other rivers are navigable for a long ways. And the concern was over siltation in the streams. It would block the uh, ability of, of uh, vessels to go further up the streams. And this really started in New York with the, you know, the Adirondacks. They were concerned, the businessmen were concerned about the Erie Canal. They didn't want their investment destroyed. Hopefully that answered your question. Yeah. So okay. Dave, you know, you've done an amazing amount of work on all this research. It's, it's like uh, spectacular. Oh, thanks. I think, you know, to make sure that it gets documented and passed on, and uh, you're you're like a you're like a, a treasure of the White Mountain National Forest. I would say. Oh, I mean, that was great, sincerely. And uh, so, as as many of you know, because you are in fact members, um, the museum is largely supported by our members. And so, if you aren't already, I hope you'll consider. Becoming a member, supporting the museum as um, as it helps us put on these programs and our exhibitions, and allows us to have students here and um, our student who greeted you at the door, and all the students who work for us. That all comes from our um, our membership donations as well. So please um, consider supporting the museum, and thank you again for your time and support over the decade that the museum has existed. Uh, we really appreciate it, and thank you all again for coming.